So, my name is uh, Aidan and I'm here today to present to you some of the work we've been doing at Imperial College London on pitch and using it to identify when speaker changes happen. Um, this is a similar, basically the same talk that I gave at ICASP in 2019 in Brighton, um, but I thought I'd make it available online um, so others may find it useful. Um, in a world that we live in today, we're talking more and more to devices, and it's becoming more and more prevalent. People are talking to their phones, their computers, probably even their microwaves. And something that humans can do very well is work out who's speaking and at what time. If I asked anyone listening to this video to listen to a recording of a meeting, you could probably tell me how many speakers there were and who was saying what at what time. But this is a problem that computers find extremely challenging. So although we can do it with near 100% accuracy, computers can't. And today I'm going to be looking at, actually, is there ways of working out when one speaker stops talking and a new speaker starts talking using the pitch? Um, because maybe that's something that humans actually use um, when they're trying to segment speech. So what actually is this whole domain of research in? And it's in the area of diarization, and diarization is simply solving the problem of who spoke when. Now, why is that extremely useful? Well, being able to work out who's speaking um, is quite, um, is at least it's more modern than working out what's being said. Um, so we've got very good about what's being said and solving that problem, but trying to solve the problem of who's saying it has been not as researched um, as the former. But the reason it's useful is we've got more and more data in this day and age that we're trying to store. So being able to put labels to transcripts obviously becomes extremely useful. Actually, the problem of working out what's being said, the ASR problem, automatic speech recognition, is improved by diarization, If you have a meeting with multiple speakers, if you can separate out those speakers and run your ASR algorithm on those um, speakers individually, it can adapt to their voice so it will work better. And finally, there's lots of single speaker-based algorithms out there so being able to open those up to multi-speaker domains, because now you can separate out the speakers, um, is extremely useful. So this is why diarization, is becoming a more of a hot topic. So what is the actual method and how does diarization systems normally work? How do they normally work? Um, so we take a speech signal, we would then segment it. So we I've represented that by these vertical bars, these dashed lines. Um, that's when one speaker stops talking and a new speaker starts. And then you would cluster the speakers. So you can see here I've put some, one speaker in red and one speaker in green. And those are the two speakers in the recording. And then you might perform a realignment step. Some algorithms do that. I'm going to be focusing on that initial segmentation step, this step, putting in those vertical bars. So why is the segmentation step actually useful? Because surely we can solve that through the clustering step. If we would just uniformly segment the speech into very small segments, then adjacent segments that belong to the same speaker will just be clustered together and we'll get um, the diarization that way. And we don't need to even do the segmentation, we can just cluster with uniform segments and then do a realignment step. Now the problem with this approach is obviously you've got very small segments, so you don't have a lot of information on the speaker when you're trying to cluster that speaker um, to a particular person. Whereas in this case, we've got lots of information on the speaker because the segments are much bigger. So if you can segment properly, um, it's something that you'd really want to do because this doesn't really help us um, in the sense that we've now got really small segments that we're trying to cluster. Whereas here we have really big segments that we're trying to cluster, so we have much more information on the speaker. So that's why this sort of segmentation and being able to do it properly is really useful. Um, and I'm gonna be looking at whether pitch can be used to do that. So before we start, I should probably mention the corpus that we've been using. So we use the Amy corpus, which is basically tries to simulate real meetings. Um, so they have about 100 hours of speech in three different rooms, mostly with non-native speakers. Um, the rooms have different acoustic properties. And if you can solve this problem, then you can probably solve most real life diarization, problems in meeting room environments. So it's quite common to see this corpus used in meeting room diarization, and that's what I'll be looking at in this talk. So if we just look at the pitch of a speaker, so if we look at this particular uh, meeting, or at least a segment of it, we've got four different speakers in red, black, green and blue, hopefully that's visible. Um, 
And as you can see, their mean pitch is very different. So if we were using the fundamental frequency of their voice, then it would be very easy, well, maybe not easy, but it would be possible, probably, to use that information. You can see, especially the green speaker and the boo speaker have very different mean pitches. And therefore, it makes sense to use that information. And a lot of clustering algorithms do use that information, that fundamental frequency. However, if we take a meeting like this, the fundamental frequencies are now very close together. These are all male speakers. They all have very similar pitches. And it would be quite hard to differentiate, especially like the black and the green speaker, uh, because their pitch is so close together. But is there still a way of being able to segment using the pitch, even in these sorts of scenarios? Um, and that's what this work looks at. But rather than looking at the meaning of the pitch, actually looking at how the pitch varies over time can help us with this problem. So looking at pitch segmentation, let's start off with what our main idea is. So we assume that pitch is smoothly varying. That's been proven already. Um, you have physiological constraints, so you can't vary your pitch that rapidly. Now, if that's the case, then surely we can model or at least predict um, future pitch values. And our idea is if we can easily predict future pitch values, or at least accurately do it, um, then if we can't, or if there's errors in those predictions, maybe that's not errors because we're poor at predicting the future pitch of a speaker. Maybe it's just because a new speaker has started speaking. And we can't assume that if a new speaker starts, we would be able to predict what pitch they would come in at. So basically, when we get rapid changes in pitch um, over time, then maybe that's just because new speakers have started speaking. And that's the main idea of this paper. Is it able, are you able to identify speaker changes based on these time varying properties of the pitch and looking at when there's rapid changes in the pitch? Is, is that indicative of a speaker change? So this is the proposed system. We first take an input signal, we then do a pitch estimation algorithm. Um, in the paper we use PFAC, and then we, we do our prediction step or our estimation of future pitch values using a Kalman filter. And then we do a speaker change detection based on how the, the, the how big the error is in our, uh, in our prediction of the pitch. We then include a VAD because we're actually trying to look at segmenting continuous bits of speech. So if you've got a long segment of speech with multiple speakers without pauses, can we still segment those long segments of speech? So first we need to have a model, a way of modeling our, our pitch. And we do that just by a random walk, which is the top equation here. And then we also need to um, model our observations. So our observations are Z, and we obviously our est pitch estimation algorithm is not going to be accurate. So we add some noise in um, to the model to account for that inaccuracies, those inaccuracies in the estimation. So that's what those two equations are. And then obviously not every frame actually has a voiced measurement. Um, so obviously pitch is only meaningful if you've got some voiced speech. If you've got some unvoiced speech or some noise, then the pitch is actually a meaningless value. So our pitch estimation algorithm gave us two things. It gave us the pitch estimate and the probability that the frame was voiced. Um, so using that, we do have a prediction on every single step, every single frame, but we don't do the update. We only do the update when we get a reliable measurement. So that's if the frame is actually voiced. So how does this prediction work? Well, the prediction just assumes that the pitch of the current frame is the same as the previous frame, which is this, because obviously between frames, we wouldn't expect the pitch to vary too much. And then we want a way of modeling how accurate um, our prediction is, which is what this variance models. And obviously, if we're just doing this prediction step, at every, every consecutive frame, this error gets worse and worse, just keeps linearly increasing. However, when we do an update step and we receive a measurement, we want our model to become more accurate because we've seen a measurement. So um, the more time that passes without seeing a measurement, the less accurate our model becomes. As soon as we see a measurement, we, we know our models become more accurate. So we decrease um, the variance, which is this equation here. Um, and we also update our prediction. So we don't want to keep our prediction the same. We want to utilize some of that measurement information in our prediction. Um, but how do we trade off between those two things, our prediction and our actual observation? And that's what the common gain does. So an extreme case where the common gain would be one, that would mean that we would just use the measurement, that our model is so bad um, that we should just use the measurement and ignore the model completely. Um, which you can imagine if this is one, then this cancels out with this and you're just left with Z, which is the observation. However, the other extreme would be when the model is 100% accurate, K would become zero, and this would completely disappear, and you would just get the model where you're saying that the pitch is equal to 
picture the previous frame. And obviously this common gain relies on this variance, which you can see here. So if the variance is very large, then k is closer to 1, meaning that the model is less accurate. So to visualise this, you can see that I've put where the frame is actually um, voiced in white lines and grey here. So that's where you can see the harmonic structure and the very, uh, there's some voice speech. And then there's the blank, black regions where there's no speech. Um, and as you can see, when there's no speech, there's no observations and you're just doing the prediction step, it linearly increases. But as soon as you start seeing some voice speech, immediately it starts to go down um, the error in the model. So this is basically just showing how we model the accuracy of our prediction. Um, so if there's been a long period of time since we've seen a measurement, the models are inaccurate. If we've seen lots of measurements previously, then the model is very accurate. That's what this sort of slide shows. Now obviously we have multiple speakers, so we don't just want one Kalman filter tracking all these multiple speakers. We want a different Kalman filter for each different speaker. So how do we actually do that? Well, we start off by tracking the first speaker. As soon as we identify a big jump in the pitch, um, a large error in the pitch, then we want to assume that a speaker change has occurred. We couldn't accurately predict um, the future pitch of that speaker. Um, so it's probably a new speaker. So we start a new Kalman filter. So then we have two Kalman filters. We have the first Kalman filter that we've now stopped and we have a new Kalman filter that's now going. And then when we see another speaker change, we see another large error in our prediction based on the measurement we've just seen. Then we want to work out, is this a previous speaker we've seen? Is this the first speaker? Or is this a completely new speaker, a third speaker? Um, and the way that we do that is we just look back at all previously generated Kalman filters, see where they stopped, and see is this new measurement close to that Kalman filter? Because if it is, maybe it's the same speaker and we'll continue that Kalman filter, that, continue that track. And if it's a new speaker, then we start a new track. So by the end, you'd hope that all the Kalman filters correspond to all the different um, speakers in the recording, um, and at least try to model the individual speakers. So every time we see jumps in pitch or errors in our prediction of the pitch, then we, we say that that's a speaker change and we pass that to a segmentation file. So we want to actually know whether this is a sensible thing to do. I, I just asserted that. But is it actually the truth? Do new speakers start at different pitches or are they influenced by the previous speaker? Or when I stop speaking and start speaking again, do I start at a rapidly different pitch? Because if I do, then that's going to be identified as a speaker change. So this is what these two tables show. So this table basically shows when there is a change in pitch, um, how often is there a change in speaker? So basically, um, if there are rapid changes in pitch, is that normally because there's a change in speaker or is that just because the speaker's doing something weird with their voice? Um, so for example, if I was to stop and go, uh, yeah, you see I've, I've raised the pitch of my voice to a much higher pitch. So that would probably be identified as a speaker change, even though it's the same speaker. However, that's not common. So it's more common that speakers, um, when there's rapid, uh, sorry, when there's large errors in the pitch prediction, it's a result of a speaker change. So you can see that up to 98% in some uh, meetings, as low as about 75% in some meetings, when there's a rapid change in pitch, um, then that's because there's a, or normally because there's a change in speaker. However, how many speaker changes do we miss because we're not actually, um, when a new speaker starts, they don't start at a massively different pitch. They actually start at a very similar pitch to where we left off. And that's what this table shows. So you can see that some meetings, it's as low as 48, 52%. Um, in some meetings, it's as high as 88%. But this sort of shows, because these values are much lower, it shows that actually you're only, you could only detect maybe 50% of the speaker changes using this method in some cases. So we need a multimodal approach. You couldn't just use this approach in isolation. However, if for some meetings you're getting almost 100%, 98% accuracy, when there's a speaker change, there's a change in pitch, then surely we want to use this information um, in our segmentation. So let's evaluate this then. How well does this compare with other methods? So we compared it with an MFCC method. So we wanted to compare if we just did segmentation using MFCCs and we used our method where we just used pitch information, how well do we actually perform? So we compared against SideKit and there's the website if you want to go and look it up, which is a complete diarization um, system, but they have something called um, SVD, which is SideKit for diarization and that's what we compared it against. So how well do we do? So if we look at the baseline, 
we have three things that we need to look at. We need to look at how often do we hit, so how often do we detect a speaker change, how often do we miss a speaker change, and then because it's common in the literature to put a collar around the speaker change, because we're never going to get frame accuracy with our speaker changes, even the labels that we're using from the Amy corpus are not going to be frame accurate, um, we have a collar. And that's why we have multi-hits, because we can hit speaker changes multiple times, we detect them in the collar multiple times. So as you can see, um, the hit rate never really gets above 60% with the MCC method. In fact, you have a very large miss rate, almost 60% in this particular meeting. However, when we use our pitch estimation algorithm, uh, using the pitch information, you can see that it massively increases. So there's a massive jump and the uh, miss goes massively down. So it shows that actually, if we were just using MCCs and just using pitch, then it's probably better to just use pitch, um, which is quite a uh, surprising result. Um, and if you want to look at an average over all the meetings, you can see that this is sort of the improvement we get from about 40, um, I think I've written it on the next slide, but it's about 44% up to about 70% um, in the hit rate, which is what we mainly care about. So yeah, as you can see, we propose a Kalman filter-based approach that uses an error-based um, method to work out when speaker changes occur. We compare that against an MCC method and we've seen a big improvement. And what are the contributions of the paper? Well, we've carried out this study to show that actually speaker changes, um, sorry, pitch changes are indicative of speaker changes. We've shown that the pitch can be modeled using a Kalman filter or can be predicted using a Kalman filter. Um, because it's smoothly varying. And we proposed a method to identify speaker changes looking at rapid um, changes in pitch using this error-based method. When we get errors in our prediction of the pitch, um, then it's normally down to speaker changes. So, um, yeah, if you have any questions, please do email me. Hopefully this was useful. Um, thank you for listening.